Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing great today. I have a message before this video starts, so if you want to go straight to the stories, then there's a timestamp in the description below for that. If not, then I want to share this today. And that's to understand that it doesn't really matter about what you've done yesterday or who you used to be before. Today and each day following is an entirely new day. Everything that happened in the past is dead information. What really counts is what you do today and being in control of your internal dialogue. It's up to you to be the hero in your own story and make the changes that you want in life. It's very easy to put the effort in into bettering yourself and doing the things you know you need to do when everything's going well. But it's on those days where everything's hard and it might feel like everyone's against you and you have to shut that out, that the real growth and resistance comes where you can be your best version of yourself. Even getting to the mindset that I have today, it wasn't easy. There was so many hard days I had to stay on top of my mind and continue to grow stronger and be the hero of my own story, which really got my mind to where it is today. And I'm not saying that my mind's perfect, because of course it's not. I still have my demons, and it's up to me to stay on top of them every single day. And I think understanding that's very important. View hard days as opportunities to become mentally stronger and stay on top of your mind. I know for me, if I have a day where I let my head bully myself, then I'm not going to achieve anything and I'll go backwards, so I have to stay on top of this voice. My mind and self-talk, for me, is my most powerful weapon, and it can either work for or against me. The day I stopped bullying myself in my head and started talking to myself the right way, everything changed and become a lot better for me. So I think it's very important people remember that. Because, to be honest, I don't always remember it, and it's quite hard to do, really. But I wanted to share that in case anybody else needs to remember that. Because let's say some tough times have come, it's very easy for your mind to revert back to the weakest self and the path of least resistance, but nothing will change if you let it do that. I promise you at the end of the day, you'll feel a lot better and your mind won't go to such dark places, so I hope that can help people. I love you as always and hope that you're all doing great. Make sure you check out my Instagram at Joe the Insomniac in the podcast in the description below. Take care. This happened when I was probably 7 or 8. When I was a kid, I lived in a pretty sketchy neighbourhood. We lived in those long apartments, ones that are attached to the sides rather than stacked on top of each other. The front of the apartment faced a main road, and there's a little street to access the park and woods and back area of the apartment. Behind the apartments is a massive field and a forest. Me and my friends and I used to go there to build hobbit holes in the grass. My mum hated it when we went out there, because there were some rough people that lived in the neighbourhood. She didn't like the idea of seven year olds playing out there, in the same place where people do drugs. I'm adding some more details so you can get a picture. Now one day, I was out in the woods by myself just exploring and pretending to be Indiana Jones or something. And I was coming out of the tall grass. I could see the little back alley in between the parking area and the woods. And I saw something lying in the grass. I believe it's a deer. I think it's just sleeping. So I creep up on it, trying to not scare it. I know, cool. <laughs> that was quite funny. When I got there, I knew something was off. The deer was too still and smelled horrible. I couldn't see its face and its back was facing me but when I got up to it I nearly had a heart attack when I saw its entire stomach is ripped open. I wasn't a smart kid <laughs> but I knew this was messed up. When I turned to run back home to tell my mum I saw another deer now to a tree next to the first. I don't know how I didn't notice this before, but its two front hooves are literally nailed to it. It's a disgusting scene as you can imagine. As I stood there, staring at it, a car drove past a little alley. I remember it's a white car with tinted windows driving really slowly. I mean, 
Everyone drove slowly on this alley because it's a residential street, but these people are barely moving. I can't see inside, but I got the sinking feeling that they were watching me. Obviously, I can't be sure that they are, but I'm 99% sure it was them. Once they were gone, I book it home and told my mum the whole thing. She told me not to go in the field again, and I agree. I really hated what I saw. For the next month or so, I saw that car drive everywhere. It would drive up and down the main road I was on while I was playing in the front yard. It would drive down and back towards the alley when I would be back in the yard. I even remember seeing it at a grocery store once, but they were definitely staking the house out. It was always the white car, tinted windows, maybe they're following me, and always driving way too slowly to be normal. I tell my mum about it, but she chalks it up to a neighbour just going down the road. So one day, my mum was out mowing the lawn. Because of the way the apartment is, she had to push the lawnmower all the way around the apartments to get to our backyard. Being the helpful kid I was, I was going to meet my mum out the back to open the gate so she can put the lawnmower in the shed. As I'm walking out the gate, I see the car come along the back alley. Normally, the car goes slow. As soon as it turns a corner, however, the driver steps on the gas zooming up behind me. The back door closest to me opens and someone gets out and starts running towards me. I don't remember what he looked like or even if it was a he. I just remembered getting back home as quick as I can, terrified. After that, my dad yelled at me for peeing myself, and neither he nor my mum believed me about the guy in the car, and I never saw him again, and we moved a few months later. <laughs> that dad sounds really harsh, Jesus. My parents still think I made up the whole thing, even though they thought how sketchy the neighbourhood was. I don't remember anyone going missing at that time in my town, but I never really looked it up. All I know is it was really messed up, and I have no idea who those people were and why they did that to the deer or what they planned for me. I just hope they never done anything to anyone else. This happened a few years ago, and we didn't know exactly who this man was, but it still scared me senselessly. When I was about 13, I used to have my bed right under my bedroom window. It was also around the time my dog was brought inside, because she got too old to stay out. At the time, we didn't have screens covering the doors like we do now, or the windows, so the windows could easily be opened and there's no barrier. I always left my window open during the day to let in fresh air, then close and lock it when it starts getting dark. The house is surrounded by forest, not very thick, but still thick enough that you can't clearly see through it. It's completely normal to hear strange noises at night, because things like bears or stray dogs or even former neighbours chickens would roam around through our backyard. So, when I heard something shuffling around my window, I didn't think much of it, and continued playing video games. Not even 10 minutes later, I heard something hit against it. It may have just been a large dune bug. When they hit a window, it sounds like rocks being thrown, so I literally ignore it. The knocking kept going, but I just kept ignoring it until finally it stopped. Fast forward until around 2am, I was finally settling down and going to sleep when I hear breathing, very faint, enough to miss if my room wasn't silent. I heard something drag down my window, like a stick or finger. I did it a few times, and that was enough for me. I jump out of bed, running to my dad's room. I told him that there was something at my window, and he immediately came to look. We turned on the lights and nothing's there. I told him what I heard and he said he's going to look in the morning. We did just that and my stomach churned. 
under my window, there were two completely different foot tracks. One back and forth besides the generator, looking directly under my window. There's even cigarette butts laying on the floor, and ashes. Like, they've been there for a while. The foot tracks led towards the woods, and seemed to stop there. We have no idea who this was, and to this day even thinking of this terrifies me. Afterward we put locks on the windows and screens up, but I'll never forget that day. Okay, so this was a normal rainy evening when I was 14. I played games until my mum come in and told me to go to sleep. But before I get to the creepy parts, I'll give you an overview of our home. Our house is located on a hill. The closest neighbours are literally 100 metres further at the road. This road leads to nowhere, so there are rarely people going past our home. Behind the house is a little forest area that I used to play in as a child. And also, the house has two floors. My room is at the second upper floor. Yeah. I gotta admit, it's a lonely house, with rain, darkness, and a forest that could keep me a little bit worried if I didn't know what was in there. So I went to sleep as usual at 11pm. I fell asleep very quickly, however, at 3am I woke up, and I didn't do that so often. I think I had to go to the bathroom or something, so I went to pee and look through the window and do my thing. But, it wasn't that relaxing nightly forest that I saw. My eyes glued on a specific character in the darkness. A man wearing dark clothes was just standing at the path of the forest. I don't know what he was doing. I started to panic of course and switched off the bathroom lights really quick. I sneak up to my parents downstairs and I've never felt so afraid moving in my home in my life. We had alarms on, but it didn't calm me. I took a look at my parents. They're asleep. My sister's not up either. I went to the kitchen and peeked through the window. There he was, still standing at the pathway, closer now. And now I can see his body. I can't figure out his face. He looks huge. I just sat at the window scared and almost fall into tears. Little rain poured to the ceiling and made naturally chill sounds. That didn't help. I peek through the window again and I almost jump out of my skin when he's standing in the yard now. I can see his face. He looks terrifying. I now ran to my parents to wake them up. My father ran out the back door, but my mum said that he could be dangerous and might be armed. She calls the police. Movement inside the house made the guy move, and he runs towards the road and the forest. My father swore that he couldn't go after him, but was mad that he couldn't. Now we wait for the cops to show up. Eventually they show up and ask questions and check out the forest with my dad. At this point, I went to sleep again with my mum, terrified but managed to sleep. I still have nightmares about this today. When I was young, me and my brother loved to go and play and explore in the forest near where we lived. We had a group of neighbourhood friends that we'd also do this with. And to be honest, those were some of my best memories. However, this would all change one day. And everything seems like normal. We set off on a normal summer's evening, and we decide we're going to play hide and seek. Now to get to where we play, we have to walk through a bit of a swamp land. I say swamp, it's not really a swamp, but it feels very similar to one. So we're walking through this stumbling around and finally make it to the giant tree. This is the exact tree that marks the spot where we play. So, I have to look for people unfortunately, but it's my turn so that's fine. I hide behind this tree and start counting. 
I finally get to one and say I'm ready for you lot. And I burst out laughing when I see one of my stupid friends has literally climbed on top of the tree, hid directly above me, got caught instantly, then starts panicking that he can't get down. I help him down and I say, you search the left side, I'm gonna go a bit deeper and find these. He says fine. To be honest more than anything, I can't wait to tell the others how stupid he was. As I'm walking, I see something up ahead. It's a dark figure. I laugh and start sprinting up there. I stumble on the way and hurt my knee though, so I was quite annoyed about this. But by the time I get there, the figure's moved. Now I'm looking around and... Something feels very odd. It feels like I'm being watched, but not like in hide and seek. This is almost like a much darker, ominous presence is there. I've literally never had a feeling like it since then. So I look around when I see part of a hand. Well, it's not a hand, it's a stick that looks like a hand, but I can make out what it is in the shadows. As I get closer, I see it's holding something. I think that's really odd. I get a bit closer and realise that it's a skeleton hand. One that looks slightly degraded, like it's been there for some time. Halloween's around the corner, so I'm sure it's a Halloween prop. I hold up the piece of paper and look inside. It says run. It's not in any of my friend's handwriting. And then, to my horror, I see a shadow appear behind me. I glance back for a second, and there's two giants of men standing there in full camo gear, with smirks on their faces. I drop the paper and let out this blood curdling scream, and I begin to sprint my way back. I end up going all the way to the tree, and to my horror, I'm met by all of my friends there who can see how scared I am, and we all sprint all the way back home. When I get there I explain what's happened, and my brother's so scared he starts crying where he's younger than me. We're more scared of getting in trouble with our parents, don't even bother telling them, but looking back on it now, I really wish I'd done something more at the time like told the authorities or something. I hate the thought that there's some twisted, mental people out there that would do something like this. God knows what their intentions were, but I can guarantee you that they weren't good. A little backstory first. I grew up in upstate New York, about 30 minutes north of Syracuse to be exact. It only made sense that I would return to my quiet little part of the world after I got out of the marines in 2007. The only problem is that I didn't have much money. The good news is that my grandfather had an old pool behind camper that he told me I could have until I got on my own feet. So, being on my own, I decided I'd spend about a year in the pool behind on a few acres of woods that I bought from a friend of mine while I was in the marines. Now all my taxes had been paid for the year, so the only thing I had to do was pay for gas and propane. I managed to avoid looking like a crazy mountain man by showering and washing my clothes at a local truck stop slash diner, even getting a pretty decent job working security. I feel the rest of my time working odd jobs for extra cash. Alright, so for the main story. It was mid-April. I was sitting next to a nice low fire while listening to my battery powered radio, watching nightfall in the woods. I had gotten a nice dinner at the diner down the road so I didn't have any work for the next few days. Generally, I don't see anyone in the woods for weeks at a time so I wasn't expecting it when I hear a scream to break the silence. I shot up, grabbed my shotgun, and get out of the camper and check the chamber to make sure it's loaded. I stood on the edge of a small clearing, strained my ears to listen for any sounds, 
It's generally hard to pinpoint sounds in the dead of night in the woods, but luckily, I hear some shouting and car doors slamming, so I knew that the sounds had to be coming from the main vehicle trail a short distance from my campsite. I made my way to the trail as fast as I could in the low light, and before I get halfway there, I heard another clipped scream to my left. I could hear a rustling in the brush. I slowly made my way there, and to where I think the noise is coming from, I come out of the woods right next to a man who had a woman pinned to the ground, just standing over her. Shaking from adrenaline, I leveled the shotgun at the top of the guy, and the woman growled at him to get off. Now I'm a big guy, but I have no doubt that the shotgun was the deciding factor in this whole situation. Each of these guys easily had a solid 30 pounds of muscle on me when I was a 200 pound marine. I ushered the two idiots back so I was between them. The woman's now getting to her feet. It was about now I realised we have another problem. My cell phone was cheap and didn't get reception in the woods. And hers had been broken by these two sickos. There wasn't much I could do other than march these two back to their jeep under the threat of shotgun. I get the license number, and I'm sure it was fake, and a description of them and their vehicle. Before the driver gets in the vehicle, I lower the shotgun to his crutch and made sure he understood what a 3 inch 12 gauge shell loaded would do. They took off in one direction, me and the woman made our way back to my campsite. We drove to the DEC station and reported it as quick as possible. It turns out that the guy I'd threatened was the young girl's now ex-boyfriend. They'd been out having a few drinks when the third wheel in the situation got a little too handsy for her liking. When she said something to her boyfriend, he basically told her to stop and get on with it for once. When she refused, the boyfriend smashed her phone and pushed her to the ground. They both pushed her into the truck and drove her deep into the woods. She had waited for them to become complacent before throwing the back door open and jumping out and taking off. Luckily, the jeep was crap and the back door didn't lock. It was a stroke of luck that I happened to be outside when she escaped. Fast forward seven months and that woman I helped is now my wife and we moved into our first house using the money I saved up living in the woods. We've been married for 8 years now, and I have two kids, a 6 year old boy and a 4 year old girl. I still go out to camp every year to hunt and haven't seen the jeep or the guys again. We heard through the grapevine that they had been arrested and actually got jail time. I'm assuming they moved to a different area because I never saw them again. I live in a suburban part of a small rural town in eastern Missouri, in a pretty quiet neighbourhood. We've had one crime here in the past three years, and it was me who committed it, a jaywalker. Comprised mostly of elderly women and single mothers, we own four vehicles, my car, my mum's van, my stepdad's car, and my mum's old truck that's illegal to drive now. So I was home alone, about a week after my graduation, while my stepdad's at work. My mum was talking to my youngest brothers, and they had to go to the doctor's office, so they left. And my two middle brothers were at their friend's house, so I was lounging on the couch in my fuzzy robe and underwear playing Fallout. Good game. My stepdad is a professional chef, and does 80% of our cooking at home. I have terrible anxiety and an addiction to investigation discovery. So whenever I'm home alone, I keep the longest sharpest knife on myself or within an arm's reach at all time. It may have saved my life, or something. This is confusing. There's a knock at the door, and it's not too suspicious. We frequently get solicitors and Mormons in the neighbourhood, so I wasn't worried. Being a cautious person, I peek out through the curtains just a bit to see who it was. 
I'd seen this guy around the neighborhood before, walking around and I don't feel threatened by him, since if he got physical, I had at least 5 inches on him and a knife. Anyway, I want to open the door, and I do so, figuring that at worst, I can politely turn him away, tell him I wasn't interested and go on with my life. At best, well, not gonna lie, he's cute in a generic way. So, I open the door, resting my hand on the back of the couch, where I've hidden the knife under a blanket, just in case. As soon as I opened the door, I knew there's something off. I've got a blunted effect due to a combination of depression, PTSD from abuse, and schizophrenic type personality disorder. So, I'm grown up, and I'm used to using fake facial expressions to fit in. I thought maybe he had similar problems because his face was not normal. He had a big friendly smile, right below a pair of absolutely dead eyes. Hey beautiful, day out. Mind if I come in for a moment, he said awkwardly. I kinda smile awkwardly and say, uh, no, my mum don't like having strangers in. Oh, his smile gets bigger. What are you doing? At this point, I'm starting to feel nervous. I shrug. Can't complain, I guess. Are you here to sell something or tell me about God? He shrugged back. Oh, you know? Can I come in? Maybe talk to your mum? Uh, I'll go get her. She's in the backyard. I move to close the door and step back, not turning my back to the dude. Before I close the doorway, he reached out and stops the door. His fake smile is gone. His face is dead. Not angry, just dead. You're home alone. Your mum isn't in the backyard. I pause and swallow hard. Then I push the door again. What do you want, man? To come in. Please let me in. I reach over, quickly sliding the knife from under my blanket and pointing it at him, saying, I'm not going to let you in. Leave. He looks down at the knife, back up at me, blinks rapidly, then asphyxiated the smile to his face again, saying, Oh, no problem. Goodbye. I watched him turn around and walk back down the street until he turned the corner. Then I locked and dead bolted every door and window in the house, got the dog out of my mum's bedroom and resumed my game in. Nah, I ended up calling my aunt's boyfriend, the only cop I trust, let him know what happened, stayed on the phone with him until my mum got home from the doctors. She called around town, found a couple of other people had seen him walking and driving around, but None of them knew who he was. So, we were on high alert for about a week. It's been over a month now, and nobody in town's seen him. This old memory of mine, I have been talking about a lot because of the recent news of the Delephi murders. As the man I'm talking about looks similar to the first sketch, but this is 20 years ago and the sketch is now irrelevant, but anyway. When I was 12, I lived in Flagstaff, Arizona. If you're not familiar with this part of Arizona, it's not what you think of when you think of Arizona. It's a pondosaur, a pine forest with mountains, and it snows in the winter. Anyway. Across the street from my home was an entrance to some woods with paths. As my parents worked, and I was the first one home after school, it was my responsibility to walk the dog. Usually, I would take him just inside the woods entrance so I wouldn't have to pick up his crap from under the rocks that would usually be in sight. Now, usually, I was too afraid to go into the actual woods, even with my dog, because he was stronger than me and didn't listen to me well when we were outside. 
The other reason I didn't like it is the uh, wolves, packs of wild dogs, sometimes cattle, seriously, and of course, anything Clarkin. For this day, I felt adventurous, I guess, and took him over there. We went pretty deep that day, and I didn't see another soul, because it's about 3pm and the people are at work. None of the neighbourhood kids really hang out there either. Now my dog was excited by anything that moved, and always wanted to greet another person, cat or dog. For this day, on the way back, I remembered him being steadfast, still pulling, walking me along on the way back home, ignoring squirrels and trees blowing in the wind. Then, out of nowhere, a man appeared on the trail in front of me. Now when I say out of nowhere, that's exactly what I mean. The woods are not dense, and usually, you can see people from a mile away, as long as they don't surprise you. The man was dressed head to toe in brown and tan colours, and gave a weak, hey, and doesn't make eye contact. The way he dressed stuck out to me, as everything but the treetops was brown, as there's actually a drought going on at the time. Even the picture I linked is more greener than it was then. As he passed me, I took a few more steps and turned around because he made uneasy and steady pace behind me, but he was gone. I could see probably 50 feet of the trail behind me. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to see him still. My kid brain starts going, maybe it's a ghost, no. He must be hiding. There's no way I wouldn't be able to see him immediately after passing each other. Maybe he was hiding in front of me, before he came out of nowhere. Maybe that's why he's got all brown on, trying to blend in. The dog didn't want to greet him anyway. It didn't make sense. It didn't take long for my dog and I to take off running all the way home. Thank god I had my goofy dog on me because he was pretty aloof, but also protective. For all I know, maybe the disappearing woodsman watched me take my dog out every day, saw me wander in that day. I know I let my dog crap in the yard a few weeks afterwards. The reason it was so weird is that he was pretty much in perfect camouflage, and he had no dog on him or reason to be out there. I'm not sure exactly who it was, it definitely wasn't a hunter either because hunting's illegal, and that's what creeps me out. Why on earth would anyone be in camouflage in the woods where hunting's illegal? My boyfriend and I went backpacking in the mountains. I've been camping before, but only camping in a car so never had to carry a bag on me for a long period of time. So this is my first time actually backpacking. Now after getting lost trying to find a parking lot, the map swore there was, but there actually wasn't. We drove around the mountains, finally finding a parking lot we could stay at. We'd planned to walk down the mountain, camp, then walk back up the following day. About an hour in, it's maybe 6pm, and we come across this guy sitting off the side of the trowel, cooking in a cheap stove. He said to us if we know why we're there and where we're at, and saying can we point him in the direction of a certain place on the mountain. He says he's parked there. He continues talking about how he had a friend drop him off who was going to pick him up at point A and then changes his story to that he's parked at point B, and then said another friend dropped him off and went to hike somewhere else, and that he needed a map or something to get to point C. Yeah, I'm confused. And I don't like his story. We finally bid the dude good luck, saying we can't help and continue down the trail. Now the trail is poorly marked and doesn't correspond with the map we found online, so we're really confused when we come to a horse trail with no markings to tell us if we're on the right path still. 
we decide to go down the trowel and see if we can find a place to camp for the night and find our way out in the morning. Both sides of the trowel are lined with barbed wire preventing us from being able to camp there. Eventually, we run into a huge puddle in the middle of the trowel. We decide to turn back and go back to the part of the trowel before it turns into a horse trowel. That way, we can camp there for the night, because it's really dark and we're tired. About 20 feet behind us, we see the man from earlier. He talks to us again, and through conversation, we learned he had heavy narcotics, including fentanyl, and another one I don't remember the name of. By this time, there's so many red flags, so we took off. Deciding to go back to the car and just drive home now. We live four hours away and we're about six miles from the car. So we take off up the trail as fast as we can go. I got severely dehydrated on the way and was struggling. I have lots of water, but it's very hot out. And we're practically running up the mountain now. Eventually, I start hallucinating thinking I'm vomiting blood, which is red Gatorade, or there was blood coming from my shoes, which is sweat, and there may or may not have been a bear somewhere nearby, but I could have hallucinated it also. We ended up doing the full six miles up the mountain in only two hours. We reached a parking lot, and that's when I gave up. I decided to wait on a branch while my boyfriend got in the car, the parking lot was curved, so we're out of sight from each other. But he finally came back down to me with the car and helped me in. We found a gas station and slept for a little while before heading home. As we're driving out the park, we see a warning sign saying there may be an escaped convict in the area. This is a true story that happened to me. Back in the 80s, I was a camper at this place in the Ardadax, a 6 million acre state park in upstate New York. All camps have their own customs and I'm not sure if this occurred elsewhere but if sitting around a campfire and smoke was blind in your face, we would utter the phrase, I hate white rabbits and I swear this worked. The smoke would immediately move towards another direction. And no, it wasn't the breathiness of speaking the words that made the smoke move. It was rumoured to be a voodoo chant though. So things are different in the 80s. Things we did back then might have gotten you kicked out of camp if you got caught. But to be honest with you these days, you would probably catch a court case and get jail time. Like the time my counsellor locked me in his room with a six packs of Budweiser, tall boys, and told me I can't come out until I finished. But that's a separate story. This camp was right on a very large and pristine lake, and periodically, there would be hikes and canoe trips to some of the islands on the lake. You choose your adventure, basically. So we're on this canoe hike to a large, huge, massive island that's not too far from camp at all. We're all slackers, smokers and stoners on this hike. My kind of people. The island was so big, it had a pretty wide running trowel that went around the perimeter of the island, wide enough to comfortably ride a four-wheeler around. Were they allowed? Wider than I was tall at the time, wide. So I mentioned this is in the 80s, right? That first night, some of us campers were partying with the counsellors, beers were being drunk. Now at the time we're sitting around a fire of course, and when the smoke blew into someone's face, they said the phrase, I hate white rabbits, and the smoke moved. The next reciprocal of the smoke said the same words, and so on and the smoke was being moved around fast from person to person. At the height of the frenzy chanting, the smoke almost looks like a vortex. The next morning, 
I open my tent to see lying on the ground, spanning the width of the running trail, the biggest dead rabbit I've ever seen in my life. It was dead. It had eyes that were glazed over blue and white. I've really never seen anything like this before. I know it could have just been coincidence, but it was crazy. This happened a couple of years ago. I wanted to go to the local wildlife trail to walk in the woods. I'd gone several times to hike and jog. I normally went with my boyfriend at the time, but he was working and I wanted to go. So I decided to go by myself. I felt pretty comfortable going. I park at the far end of the parking lot in case anyone else appears. The trail continues straight from the parking lot for about a mile until it curves up a large hill. Where I wanted to go was the abandoned parking lot with a lake. The turn off to this part of the trail was about 400 yards down to the left. Once you turn left, you have about 200 yards of flat trail before it inclines. This incline section is loose gravel and it's quite noisy when you walk up it. The last section is about 100 yards. I felt pretty at ease going along the straight trail before I turned left. When I hit the incline, I began to feel uneasy. I brushed it off as being overly paranoid and continued. As I went about halfway up the incline, I began to hear crunching and snapping of twigs in the woods to my right. It sounded about a hundred yards off. It was just far enough into the woods that I couldn't see what's making the noise. I froze in my tracks and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I stood still as I heard the crunching stop. Stupidly, I brushed it off as a deer or bobcat. I continue up the path until I hit the end of the incline. That's when I heard this thing in the woods beginning to run at me. I froze in fear, my heart beating a million miles an hour. Every hair on my body stood up. I was rooted in place, that's when I saw him. A man was running straight for me while holding something in his hand. I began to run down the incline back to the main trail. I was slipping and sliding down the gravel. I looked behind me and noticed how that he's at the top of the incline already. He had this evil look in his eyes. I noticed the item in his hands was a knife. I almost slipped up due to me looking back at the man. He called out to me. Get back here now. His tone was malicious. I sprinted as fast as I could and took a hard right back onto the main path. When I hit the parking lot, I didn't look back. I unlocked my car and started as quick as I can. Right as I was backing up, he emerges from the trail entrance. He just stands there partially covered in the shade of the trees. As I tear through the parking lot and onto the highway, he just stares at me. The biggest creepiest smile comes across his face as he slowly waves at me as I get onto the highway. I never went back to that trail. This encounter has scarred me for the rest of my life. I hate walking through the woods now. Okay, so I have no idea exactly what I saw that night. I have searched everywhere for sightings or even myths around that area we saw it and found nothing. If anyone has any idea of what we saw, please let me know. My husband and I think it could have well been a Wendigo, but I don't know. I haven't heard anyone else say they've seen anything like it. I guess more than anything, I want to know what I saw and have some closure. So anyway, my friends and I go camping a lot, and my favourite place is the Red River Gorge, Kentucky. We go there often. I've been going there since I was an infant. I'm 28 now, married with a kid and still go. It's the coolest place to go where I live, and you can actually see the Milky Way pretty much every night. I mean, it's perfect for stargazing. 
and I've seen a shooting star every clear night that I've been there. When we go there without our kid, we might have a hike and stargaze for hours. Our first experience happened when we were night hiking, and we would go on trails we knew well, and we used frequently during the day. Ones with log fences and gaze by resting places. The most used trail is in the National Bridge State Park that leads up to the Natural Bridge. The trail is around two miles uphill, depending on where you're starting. Now I've done this trail every summer of my life and could do it blindfolded. It has wooden steps, carved rock steps, log handrails, multiple sitting points under a roof, trash cans, but after reaching the main trailhead, there's no lights at all. It's used often and while it's uphill and the difficulty is low, as long as you have a good grip on your shoes and water, you'll be fine. My friends have done it with me multiple times and we're confident as hell at it. Hiking this trail at night is not allowed, but the woods have never really been a problem for me and no one really cared about the closure times. When we use this main trail to hike to the top, we would park in a lot designated for the Paul and Hoedown Island. You walk across the road that leads to the pool, and you're at the first trail marker. You go up the gravel for a while and pass the Natural Bridge State Park Lodge. There's a waterfall and some lights, so it was best to go fast and watch out for rangers that would tell us to leave. Then walk across another road and there's a mini shelter to sit on or a small rock where you can rest your legs. Then, it's the beginning of the top of the trail. The night was weird to begin with. As soon as we started the hike, the clouds took over and it appeared we'd be walking for nothing even to stargaze at. But we went anyway, just in case it cleared out by the time we get there. In the beginning, it was normal, and paranoia was kinda setting in, but eased up a little. You know you've reached the bottom of the bridge when you see a giant limestone wall. Now during this time, there was a gazebo that set to the right of this wall, and the trail continued and followed next to the wall. When you come far, there's a fairly steep part of the trail, and the gazebo is welcomed. Now my husband, my best friend at the time, and I all sit on the gazebo steps. The bench is under a roof, and even darker than the rest of the outside, so we just stayed on the steps, facing to where we're looking downhill at the trowel that follows the limestone wall. We each have a bright LED headlamp and a handheld flashlight. We don't usually look at each other when we night hike because the lights are so bright. We sit in a line like the Lord's Supper and walk in a line staggered so we don't blind each other. It's after hours at this point, so no ski lift rides had gone on for hours and the rangers had already done the sweep and left before we could get there. We left no time between them making sure the trowel and the top were clear and start our hike. The ski lift takes you to the top but there are workers that stay and do counts and only leave after it's clear. I guess I have to make these points because that's what I was thinking, when what seemed out of nowhere, a girl with a headlamp begins to walk down the trowel. This is kind of odd really. She's in a sundress and flip flops. This hike is uphill, and while it's fairly easy to hike up, it's not easy to do without real shoes or water. She'd have to have hiked up and down to get to this point without food or water, which is a massive challenge. Her light seemed almost blinding too. When she reached where the trail turns from in front of the gazebo to down where we came from, she stopped. She just stood there, how a human is presented in an anatomical drawing. She was looking directly at us all, sitting there, and her light made me bring my head up. It was so bright that I literally had to shield my eyes. She didn't turn away from our light at all or even seemed bothered, she's had six LEDs shining directly at her face. I say hello. 
She said kind of with a pause between every word something like, Hello. How are you? I said something like, Good. How are you? And she took an even longer pause before saying, Oh. I'm fine. And she just stood there with her hands to our side, facing down, staring at us. Her light made it impossible to really see her face. It was unnaturally bright. I had my hand up the entire time to not be blinded still. Until she turned and slowly walked down the trowel part we just came up. She got to the part where the trowel turned and we saw her light just stay in that one spot for a minute until she turned and the light faded out of sight. We wait for a while before continuing up. I kept making comments about how weird that was, and had anybody else just seen this? And was I being overly paranoid with my fear? And why did no one come after her? Why had she done this all alone at night? And somehow without being found by any ranger, we got up after a bit and started back up to the top. It felt like it took much longer than it ever had in the past, but we made it to the top. There's stone steps named Fat Man Squeeze that you get to at the top of the bridge and you can walk across it and whatever. Going up and being on the top, we can hear twigs snapping, almost alternating from left to right. We lay down and stargaze, but the clouds are thicker now. It was miserably hot, and we can hear voices at the same time. My husband kept checking for people. He never saw anyone. We see a flashlight, but we never see anyone attached to it. And then we hear a bird call. It wasn't like a real bird noise at all. It was like someone making bird calls, rhythmic and not natural. I'm convinced now that we're not alone, and hadn't been alone at all during this. And to say this is a lot because I'm not easily spooked. I ask to leave as soon as they're done. They then tell me that they're ready to go right then and there, and that scared me. It showed that I wasn't imagining all of this and they're just as scared as I am. We began going down the way we came from and it felt like it was taking so long. We were going steady and quick, and it was downhill, but we were not making any ground, it seems. It's hard to explain, but it was so weird to the point that I said aloud, this feels much longer than it should be, and everyone agrees with me. I keep looking behind me with the flashlight, and my husband kept looking out to the sides. I kept feeling watched and couldn't figure out where the footsteps were coming from. It sounded as though they are coming from all directions. I would turn my head in the direction of a sound and not see anything. When my husband was walking, he kept saying he was catching eyes in the flashlight. Usually you catch a raccoon's eye spying on you. But he was afraid maybe it's a bigger animal like a bear or something. And even weirder is that, he never seemed to catch contact with it truly when his flashlight went over it. Now by now, we're hiking down a semi-flattish area, compared to the downhill hike we've been doing at least. The log fence or handrail or whatever it's called is on our right side. Now, we're walking in a row within reaching distance of this barrier, and my husband just stops walking altogether and says, What's that? But the question is more of an alert than a question. I move my headlamp in that direction and don't see anything at first. Then, both of his lights catch a shape. And then, my headlamp also does the same. I move my headlamp to the center and catch it while my friend simultaneously finds it in her lights as well. All six shine on a kind of reflective grey creature. It's bent in a crouching position, kneeling on its front leg, and it starts turning towards us. It starts to turn slowly, and my mind is racing. It looks like a human, but it's too big. 
people mistake human shapes for what's actually bears, but this is skinny. It's thin and big, and almost white. It's so light grey. Its skin resembles that of a dolphin. There's a shine to it, and our lights get reflected a little way when they're on it. It gradually comes to a standing position in front of us. Its head is long, and its eyes are in a human position on its face, not on the side like most animals. We can't see other facial features, just big, almost empty holes or pits where its eyes are. It looks directly at us and our lights. The way it stood is almost intimidating, almost like when a snake raises up and flexes their necks in a wild fashion to show how strong and smart they are. It was like it was stepping up for a fight, from crouching, then standing directly in front of us. The arms hung down so low, the hands seemed way too long. Its hands had to be by its knees easily. I guess it stood nine feet or so, and not that far in front of us. No, it has no hair at all, and its head is large. I couldn't process what I was seeing. I was truly frozen. Then, I just feel my husband hitting me, yelling run. I start to understand we have to get away from this thing, and it pivots and runs to the right, going backwards on the trowel so it could get around the barrier and onto the trowel behind us. We take off running the rest of the way down the trowel, knowing that this thing just took off much faster than us and after it had crossed from behind the barrier, it would be gaining on us quick. We didn't talk at all because we tried to figure out what was going on and knew it wasn't good to draw attention to us. We kept running as fast as we could, but some areas are steep. It literally never feels as though we're out of sight from this creature. And we made it to the trowel beginning with the gravel and we can hear something to the side crashing down through the forest. We ran until we got to the car, then drove as fast as we could, and as soon as we got to the main road, we're finally out of there. When that thing looked at us, I knew it was smarter and faster than us. I knew that if we didn't react, something terrible would have happened. We made it back to where we were all staying, and all of us took out our phones and wrote a note of what we saw. We haven't spoke about it until after, and we all looked at each other's phones and the stories are all exactly the same. When I was 12, me and a group of my friends would play hide and seek in those woods where we're on the edge of our neighbourhood. We would always play at around 6, but I had to be home by 10. 10.30 at the latest on a weekend, and we weren't allowed to go so far that we couldn't see our houses. Those are the only rules our parents had for us. Well, one Friday, we're out playing in the woods as usual, and I, for whatever reason, decide to go in the woods deeper. I can't remember how far I went into those woods, but I do remember coming across an old shack. I consider using it as a hiding place, but then I thought that they wouldn't come this deep into the woods to look for me, so I decide to head back. However, when I start to head back, I turn my head to look at the same shack one last time, and for a split second, I see someone peeking around the door. Whoever it was quickly turns their head back, when they saw me, and I don't pay much attention to it and head back. I'm about halfway through my walk when I hear, Hey kid, come over here. I look back and see an old man hiding behind a tree, gesturing for me to come. I know better, and took off running. While I was running, I heard him yelling, Wait now, come back. And I could also hear the sounds of other footsteps accompanying him after me. When I got to the end of the woods, I ran into my friend's house, who was wondering where I was. I told them to get out of the woods, and we ran to our friend's house. I told them what happened, and eventually, 
I told my mum what happened too. Our parents called the police to search for the woods, but they never found anything. And our parents never let us play out again after that. Old man living in the shack? You could still be out there. I just hope you get caught and haven't done anything worse. My old man was an avid outdoorsman in the Colorado Rockies in the late 80s. He'd go on week-long treks with his buds. One summer, they'd been out for a few days in the Pikes National Forest. They set up camp in a ravine they thought was safe. That night, my dad unzipped the tent to take a leak in the dark and outside stood a pair of bare pal feet. My dad screamed and zipped up the tent. Everyone else woke up and said what's wrong. My dad said someone was barefoot out there, and they went out and flashed their flashlights for a bit hollering. My dad swore that he saw the feet and described them in perfect detail. They were old blotchy feet, even having a lump on the ankle. Tony, his bud, asked what foot, left or right, and my dad said it was a riot. Then Tony said they needed to move their camp immediately. My dad says why? Tony says he doesn't have time to explain. They all go along with it and pack up and move up to the hill. The next morning they woke up to find a flash flood had torn through the ravine that night. It would have surely killed them. Tony's grandfather had just died a month prior and one of the last things he said to him was that he would always watch over him. The feet described reminded Tony of his grandfather's very feet. My dad is highly religious too. Supernatural or not, it's terrifying what happened to them. So this happened to me when I was about seven, and I lived in Portland with my grandparents. Now my grandma and I would always watch Lost together every night, and then the news would always come on afterwards. When we saw there was a sniper that was going around our area, in the woods somewhere, and they were looking for him, and lost his location, it blew our minds. I remembered one day at school, the whole school had to go on lockdown, because someone reported seeing him near the school, and so, Everyone had to go to the hall and wait out the entire situation to clear. I don't think we left school until 7pm. The police caught him and took him in for questioning. Later on, we found out through the news that he was hiding out in these small woods that are behind our house, literally metres away. Now my grandma and I would go for bike rides and walks most evenings. The only reason we hadn't was because of the shooter. I refused to leave the house for a good week or so because I was scared that he'd still be out there and I wouldn't let my grandparents leave either because I was so scared something bad would happen to them. To this day, I still have a mini panic attack every time I go near them woods. Just the thought that at some point in time, only meters away, there was a killer waiting in the woods and camouflage terrifies me. It was the end of my freshman year of college, so my friend and I spent a weekend at my family's cabin by ourselves to celebrate. The weekend was fairly uneventful. The most exciting things to happen were burning a pizza on a grill and a chipmunk trying to join me while I was in the outhouse, which is pretty funny. But then, we had to leave. Even though I'd gone to the cabin every summer since I was born, I still didn't know very well how to get from it. We had been using my friend's dad's GPS. It was pretty old and probably hadn't been updated in a while, which is likely why it took us where it did. The route we took was fairly unfamiliar to me, but what do I know? It's a GPS. I trusted it enough to bring us wherever we needed to go. It ended up taking us down a twisted side road that I knew was wrong, but I kept going, 
thinking that maybe going through the woods would be faster. That's when it told me to take a left. I obeyed, but was extremely confused because it looks to be a dirt road. I slow down to look at the GPS when my friend lets out a horrid, oh my god. I look up and realise we're not on the road at all. We're on someone's driveway. Then I saw the dolls. They were worn by the weather, full of dirt and faded from the sun. The ones I took note of were clowns, and bodiless and beheaded. There were so many, I can't even make out how many there actually are. Every single one's hanging from a tree. My friend and I were both shrieking at this point. Her yelling at me to back up and get out of there. Me yelling what the hell over and over again. We safely got back to the main road and followed that until the GPS gave us a different route, which took us home without incident. Although I didn't see the person living in that rundown house, it was one of the most terrifying things that ever happened to me. It didn't even feel real when it was happening. It felt like I'd been dropped into the middle of a horror movie about a serial killer with some doll fetish or something. Sometimes, I wonder what would have happened if the person who lived there actually saw me pulling up. But I try not to let my imagination get the best of me. I hate to think of whoever's responsible for that house, if they still live there. I've been really wanting to share this story for some time now, but I haven't found a good outlet until coming across here. About five years ago, my wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with our two closest friends, another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite and really beautiful. The beauty of it and creepiness of it is that you take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It's extremely secluded, but never felt threatening. It's a really popular campsite, so there's always people around, especially in the summer. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I remembered having a great time there. The campsites are fairly close together, and usually separated by various shrubs etc. I thought we were all getting pretty pumped up about the site, as there were no neighbours around the site, just forest, and no one occupying the site closest to us. This isn't common, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day 2 started normally, we had breakfast and then head to the lake for a couple hours, the lake was about a 20 minute hike from the main campground. We ended up getting back at around 2ish, and we noticed that the site next over to us had a silver rented car parked on it. We didn't think much of it, and went about a fire. At some point, we noticed the occupants of the site next to us. It's a pretty average looking white dude, maybe early 40s. He was so average looking that it's hard to even picture him. We all immediately caught on to the fact that he was constantly looking over at us. My friend Dave even made a comment to me under his breath saying, You notice that guy keeps looking here. I remember feeling uncomfortable as we're all in our bathing suits from the lake. But, I make a conscious effort just to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we're a little buzz slash drunk, not out of control just feeling good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly staring at us. In hindsight, Dave or I should have called him out. The story doesn't make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip and really didn't want to let some creepy dude throw off my relaxed vibes. The alcohol coupled with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him led to us not confronting it. I just thought he was a lonely dude. Aside from the start, there were a couple of mildly weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that at some point, he left his site to go and do whatever. When he was gone, a girl, probably in her mid-twenties about our age, walked by it and snaps a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything. She smiled and awkwardly kept going. 
Dave and I both thought it's odd, but we're preoccupied with beer. Later in the evening, around 7ish, the camp host was doing her round checks on people. She kept checking us in and moved on to him. I remembered all of us eavesdropping intently to what they're saying. I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know there was a bathhouse, or even what a bathhouse was. But he had a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? When's it open? Is it private? Which are not weird, but in context, definitely odd. The sun started to go down. We are all drunk, so we weren't too concerned with the creepy dude anymore. At one point, we went for a walk and I noticed him snooping around what we believed to be the bathhouse. Now, I would call out this kind of behaviour, but again, I was drunk and five years stupider at the time. We all continued to laugh and talk about how creepy he was. Now, we have a good time and keep drinking. At one point, the guy started eating beans aggressively <laughs> out of a can in the light of his single lantern, no fire. He looked at us while doing so, and Dave and I had noticed this and kind of snicker at each other about how weird it is. Eventually, <laughs> compose yourself. Eventually, we decide to go to bed. I think the guy had left his sight at this point. I remember joking, saying, I better not wake up to that guy looking in our window. My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in the camper shell with their truck. I remembered feeling creeped out as I fell asleep, but shrugged it off. Around 2am, both my wife and I were jolted away by what we thought was a woman's scream. We both looked at each other and asked if each other heard that. We come to the conclusion that, it was probably somebody trying to be loud, and decide to go back to sleep. As I was trying to sleep, I start feeling very unsettled. I decide to get out of the car and take a look around. I check my door, trying to be as quiet as possible. I'd gotten about one leg out of the car when I heard faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell about four feet away. I froze and then heard it again. I eventually realised that they were trying to tell me something. I whispered, what? And I heard Dave say, can you hear that? Start your car. I instantly realised that something is wrong. So rather than ask questions, I climbed back into my car and start it right away. Dave and Sarah busted out of the back of the camper and frantically jumped into my car. They tell me drive. They were too freaked out to even explain anything. Eventually I pulled over, figuring we're far enough away from whatever had freaked them out. Now finally, Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what happened. As she put it, she was woken by a light coming from a creepy dude's campsite. Apparently, he had lanterns and flashlights to spotlight himself, naked, staring in our direction. It gets weirder. At some point, he turns off the lights and tries to signal across to us. I'm talking like Morse code or something. Across the ravine, an old RV begins using its headlights to signal back. Dave is awake now. I question them on this detail, and they're both very clear they were communicating. Keep in mind, it's absolutely pitch black out. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on the window. This is what caused Sarah to scream, hence waking me up. At this point, I decide we need to call the police. The problem was, there was absolutely zero cell service at the campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half up an old camp service road that was already very remote. So leaving at night wasn't an option. We decided the best course of action was to alert the camp host. We drove around and eventually found the trader she lived in. She was understandably confused to be woken up at 3.30 in the morning but was responsive. She mentioned that the guy was really weird when she even checked him in, and she called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently, there was a massive wildfire burning that weekend, and the police can't even send anyone until sunrise. The camp host said there wasn't really anything she could do beyond that. It really sucked to hear that. Now, 
I don't know what we can do, not to mention there's still that guy in the RV. One more thing really weird happened. It's around 4am, we're all sitting in my car when a man in a hood walked right up to the window, and the second I noticed him, I turned on my engine and headlights. I'm not kidding you, he bolted off into the trees. We all sat in my car until sunrise, once the light was out. We went back to the site to pack up our things. His car was there with blankets hung in all the windows. The whole thing just felt gross and we wanted to get out of there so quickly leave. After a couple of hours we left, I get a call from the police. They said they went out to the campsite and questioned the guy. He said he was simply showering. The cop told me there was nothing he could do. It was our words against his. He questioned the RV people. They said they didn't know anything, but he mentioned a quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police is frustrating. I tried following up. I even tried getting help from a family member who's a sheriff, but even he said there wasn't anything they could do unless that particular police chief really wanted to investigate. So there's my story. I learned a lesson about being polite when somebody's making you feel uncomfortable. Nowadays, I'm much more aggressive with crazy people. I also know it's not easy to hear this story and wonder why Dave or myself didn't just confront the guy, especially when he's literally naked near us. I don't know. I wish I had more courage, but honestly, it's really scary in the moment and you have no idea what their potential is. I'm okay admitting that. Clearly we were dealing with a very messed up person who had accomplices. I can only imagine their end goal. I hate to think of it. I just wish the police could have acted better. This happened in 2004 in northern Wisconsin. I was 16 at the time, out hunting deer with my dad and a friend of his, Frank. Now, I do remember this day like it was yesterday. My dad and I had a few different stands over in an area of maybe about three quarter square mile. He had been hunting there for at least 10 years, and I'd been going with him since I was five, up until I was about 12, which is the legal age to hunt with a rifle. This particular morning, we walked to my first stand. It's about five in the morning, so pretty dark out. I got situated and my dad and Frank went off to our other two stands over a ridge, maybe another 600 yards off. Sitting there in the dark is always eerie, now not long after they left, I see a flashlight off in the direction that they left. It's always eerie in these situations. It's roughly 200 yards away now, moving in my direction. I figure they forgot something from the truck or I don't know, so I decide to radio to see what they're doing. We're sitting in the stand, Frank's about to head to another one. He says, obviously this flashlight is somebody else. Now this isn't super uncommon, and isn't really a big deal. The woods get crowded sometimes, and there is a spot to park in that general direction. I turn on my light so the other person knows I'm here. I ended up dozing off though, as it's pretty dark out. Now when I wake up, the sun's up, it's around 8am, and I sit there for a bit. I radio my dad to see if he's heard or seen anything moving, nothing yet. There's a couple of gunshots off in the distance. I get up, go for a slow little walk to get my blood moving again. Then, not far away, maybe 30 yards out, I decide to return. When I come back to my sound, I sit down and take a real good look around. I have the feeling that I'm being watched, but nothing's going on. I finally look out to my left when I saw a big flashlight and something orange. For anyone unfamiliar, hunters have to wear blaze orange during the gun season. I radio to my dad and Frank to see if either one of them are here. My dad says no. I hear nothing from Frank and decide to grab my binoculars out of my backpack to see if it's Frank. This is not Frank, and this guy is looking at me through his scope. 
rifle aim directly at me, which is a massive no-no. You never point your rifle at anyone, under any circumstances. Dumb people still do it though. It's few and far between, but it happens, which is why normal people like us use binoculars. At first I'm like, what an idiot. Thing is, even with me looking at him, he doesn't point the gun down. Now I'm starting to panic, thinking that he might shoot me. I slowly grab my rifle, get up and stay behind as many trees as I can and walk down a little path to the side of my stand. My stand is on this kind of little knot. It's on the side of a much larger hill. I radio to my dad and tell him what's up. He says sit tight and stay out of sight. Obviously, as a 16 year old, I can't do that and keep looking. Every time I look, he's aiming at me. He's always in different spots, still moving to my direction. I go back to look again, and he would be 30 yards away from the last time. A good 10 minutes of this happen, and my dad radios to me. How you doing, bud? Looking back, he's obviously trying to keep me calm at the thought that something serious might happen. He's still there, but keeps moving. I don't know his problem. My dad tells me, just keep hidden, he'll figure it out, that he'll be coming up near him in a minute or two. That's when I hear the shot. I lose my mind trying to get hold of my dad. Did he just get shot? Where is he? Did he have to shoot this guy? What's going on? I sit there for maybe three minutes. Feels like hours and I hear, alright, coming out and head towards my stand. I peek over and I see my dad waving from alongside the ridge that the guy's been on. It turns out, Frank had been really restless and took a stroll and ended up on the other side of that particular ridge that the stranger's on not knowing he's there. He knocked his radio batteries loose and couldn't communicate with us. Turned out the shot was actually Frank shooting a deer. My dad said as soon as Frank shot, the guy walked off from towards us and enter the logging road out of sight. I was driving late at night on the I-90 between Deer Lodge and Misola, MT. I'm originally from Seattle and I was driving back to Seattle after visiting family in Bozeman and Billings. The stretch of freeway between Deer Lodge and Mizola has some weird small mountain towns along either side. It's occasionally interrupted by large truck stops. Anyway, it's about 11.30 at night and I'm on my way to my hotel in Mizola when I notice that I need some gas. I stop off in this random small town with one gas station with a 24 hour pump. It had a convenience store attached to it but it was closed. I get this really weird vibe from the station as soon as I pull up to the pump. I hadn't turned off my car yet. I just put it in park and the engine was still running. I was about to shut off my car when, out of the corner of my eye, I see a dark figure come from the side of the closed convenience store literally running at my car. Some instinct actually kicks in and I pull my car back into drive and get the hell out of there. I look back in my rearview mirror to see the figure chasing after my car for a few seconds, but by that time, I make that turn and get back onto the freeway. I literally can't shake the feeling that I'm being followed for the rest of my drive either. Now this happened in 2009, so while smartphones did exist, they weren't as prevalent or as good as they are today. Even with my flip phone that I have at the time, I can't even get signal on it. Secondly, the events of the gas station happened in a span of about 20 seconds. Yeah, really quick. I arrive, park, turn off the car, see the dark figure running towards my car, and I put my car back into drive, burn rubber to get out of there, and I see the dark figure chasing after my car, tearing up on the freeway. And finally, someone mentioned the story of the Wendigo, and I've heard about it, but I wasn't isolated up in the mountains, and this was less than 30 seconds away from the freeway, so I don't really think it was that. 
I think the dark figure was a desperate meth head looking to rob someone or hurt someone. After you've driven hundreds of miles, your brain doesn't really think straight, but I don't know what it could have been. All I know is that it terrified me, and I still think about it to this day. I was walking on a trail in the crater lake to get back to my car, and as I'm doing so, I hear somebody running behind me. I look, and it's an older man by himself. I quicken my pace as the sun is setting, and it would soon be dark. He stops running, and starts up again, getting closer, and I do the same trying to keep distance. It felt creepy, and I was so thankful when I saw another woman with a big dog not too far in front of me. I met up with her, and eventually, so did the guy. We all walk together now, and this man is very strange and socially awkward. He had a camera. I'm certain the woman and I had the same creepy feeling from the exchanges we'd given each other. She said if he came here alone, and he replies that his family is already down the hill waiting for him. I immediately felt very ill when I heard this. And then, the really weird thing happened. He took at least three pictures of the woman and I. I could have asked him to delete them, but honestly, he probably never would have done so. And I just wanted to get back to my car, because he's making me feel very uncomfortable. We finally reached the bottom of the hill, and I noticed that there's no family in sight for him. He gets in his car alone and drives off. I felt very lucky there was another person there with me. I'm sure he was some kind of predator. So I went on a back camping trip in some youth program in North Cascades near Seattle. One of us got hurt from falling on a rock on our way to the base camp, so I had to help carry him back to the trailhead while being accompanied by one of the leaders. On the way back, we came across another young hiker, a woman. We talk as we're kind of taking a rest. She said she was going to summit one of the peaks on the trail later. The problem is, that's about eight hours away, and she only has a light backpack. Now the next day, back at base camp, helicopters swarmed, and men were dropping. It was like a movie. I was taken back. Little did I know, there was a huge search and rescue looking for the same woman I interacted with just hours before. For three days every night, all I would hear was the distant calls of men yelling out her name, echoing off the basin walls in an endless search. I remembered hearing it was supposed to be a suicide, that she was a seasoned hiker, yet she didn't pack properly enough, it didn't make sense. Perhaps she just wanted to go a little bit further than stay. I remembered after I flew home I would never stop thinking of her, and I never stopped. I still look her up, just to see that she is never found, but she's not with her family and I hate that. You just have to be really careful when you're hiking. This was a few years ago in October, actually around the time the nationwide clown stuff was happening. It's hunting season, and I'm driving to a town north of where I live to meet my dad and ride with him in his truck. It's about 4am. Now when I pull off the freeway, I'm waiting for the light to turn green when I see a dude cross the road. Totally normal. I pull away and turn into the parking lot for the usual meeting spot, a park and ride situation. I turn off my car and wait for my dad. I took off towards the main road, and that's when I see a young guy walking towards my car. It's October and really cold, so I can't even see out the windows well. He just continues walking right up next to me until he's about 15 feet away from my car. He just stood there for maybe for 10 minutes motionless. 
just staring at me. I wasn't even too spooked. Like I said, it was hunting season, so I can defend myself, but after 10 minutes, he turns around and walks away, literally never to be seen again. To this day, I still have no idea who he was or what he wanted from me. I've spent my entire life in the woods, taking regular hikes up to 20 miles on the weekends deep into canyons and headwaters of the pond, often in the dark fishing for steelhead. I also used to work building logging roads deep in the forest alone. I've seen lots of animals, cougars, bobcats, wolves, turkeys, bears. I've never been frightened, scared or come across something I couldn't explain. My grandfather-in-law is an avid hunter. He spent his entire life doing it and told me a few stories. During one trip while hiking in a draw on Washington, Somebody shot at him from the ridge. The shot put a hole in the stock of his rifle. He yelled and the guy took off, and he never caught up with him. I wonder if there's a guy out there somewhere, wondering if he killed a guy. He also said to me one time, way out on a mouth-long hunt, he came across a wind chime, about a hundred feet off a tree. It was late fall, so all the leaves were gone, and he could clearly see it and hear it. He has no idea how it got up there. My family and I were driving from Ohio to Wyoming one holiday season to visit family about 10 years ago. Due to storms further north, we travelled straight west instead of from northwest at first and split the trip at Omaha. Staying the night before heading up through Nebraska into South Dakota. Once we're far enough north, we turn west onto I-90. At that point, it's been over an hour since we saw anyone. And we really needed a public restroom. We're on the state route, so there's no rest areas. Those of you who have travelled with a young child know that they have a bladder limit and our daughter won't stop begging to pee. SD was similarly deserted, or even worse, as we headed west. Finally, we reached a desperately needed rest stop, as my at the time five-year-old and I both needed to pee by then. Just as we pull in, the truck that had been following us for a while pulled in too. I didn't think too much of it at first, until I started to open my door. My head was turned to the right when the truck had parked a couple of spots over. My eyes met the driver's, and I just shivered. He was a skinny white guy with scraggly brown hair and dark eyes. I could see he was wearing a dingy slash dirty blue plaid shirt. He got out of his 90s brown and cream truck and started rummaging in the bed. I told my husband I didn't want to go to the rest stop alone because the guy's giving me really weird vibes. He thought I was being a little silly but agreed to come with us. Now by this point, the next stop is Wall, SD, about 100 miles away, according to the huge billboards that we had passed advertising, so... He figured he'd better empty his bladder even though he didn't feel like he needed to. I grabbed our daughter and we headed back inside followed by the guy who had finished rummaging around his truck but wasn't carrying anything when I glanced back. My daughter and I did our business in the women's restroom and head back to the lobby. As I expected, now my husband's already waiting out there. Now, the old guy was also in the lobby area. He was just standing there staring at my husband. My husband rushes us back to our car. As we're buckling in, he locks the doors and told me that the guy hasn't even went to the restroom. Instead, he was just standing in the lobby the whole time. He agreed with me that we might need to just get out of here and it was probably a close call. However, the story didn't end there. Remember how I mentioned Wall and it's about 100 miles away? Well, that was 100 miles of pretty empty landscape, but 
a decent number of turn-offs from the interstate. We didn't see the truck following us and thought the whole episode is actually behind us. Except when we stopped in Wall to grab lunch and some snacks. When we get there, we see the guy in the store, not even 20 feet from us, same clothes, everything. He starts staring at us and we pay for our snacks and immediately get out of there. I can't believe the fact that he followed us for over a hundred miles. Thankfully, after speeding out of there, we never saw him again, but I was seriously creeped out until we reached our relatives in Wyoming safely. I grew up poor in the mountains of Southwest Virginia. We didn't really have internet. It wasn't available. We lived in rural, isolated locations, so no kid would actually go out to play with us. As a teen, I would spend most of my time hunting or riding my bike a few miles to the river to go fishing. I was a stereotypical country boy. I was and am completely comfortable at home in the woods by myself, even at night. We had hounds and I took them out alone at night to go hunt raccoons. I went to our hunting grounds and turned them loose, same as I've done lots of times before. I sat down and waited for them. We didn't have the best dogs. They were young and not trained yet. They wouldn't normally find raccoons and would try and go for a deer or a rabbit. After a few minutes, they hadn't opened and that was very odd. I started to walk and call out for them, but I don't get a response, so this is odd. I kept walking and come out into the brush and into a cow field so I can walk easier and go call them in the next holler over. Now a holler is a small valley in between the ridge lines. As I come out into the cow field, I notice the entire ride line is glowing red. It was the first time that the farmer was clearing brush and so he has a bonfire burning. I went to check it out and make sure it wasn't starting a forest fire. As I got closer to the top of the ridge, I noticed the glow was solid and not flickering like flames should. There was no smoke that I could smell. I noticed the sheer amount of light and most of what I thought was colour is actually vibrant red. The only way I can describe it is a stoplight on a dark street, it's casting a glow on everything, changing its colour to roughly that. I froze. This isn't coming off as something natural. Where I am is miles off the beaten path with definitely no electricity. It would have been possible for a lifted 4x4 truck or tractor to get there, but no way would it make this much light without a lot of vehicles lined up with a parking brakes on. I had a 20 gauge single shotgun loaded with me. It happened to have a few shells of a buckshot and some slugs in my backpack. I quickly loaded a slug and held a few shells in my hand, ready for follow up shots, prepared to defend my life. I was terrified. I snuck home as quickly as possible without using my flashlight. I told my mum and stepdad what happened, but they brush it off and I'm scolded for leaving the dogs in the wood. I guess he thought I was just lazy and didn't want to go after them. The next day, I went back and looked for any signs of what I might have seen. Now there was absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. No burnt areas, no tire tracks, nothing. After a few days, I woke up and went into the living room. My stepdad was waiting for me. He jumped up and said he'd seen that light also. He'd been hunting in another location in the opposite direction, still within walking distance. He was waiting for the dogs with his light off when three bright flashes illuminate around him and make things glow red. He said it was bright enough that he could have read a newspaper at night. I thought it was so crazy for him to experience it too. We never had another encounter with the red light. I don't know what it was. I'm not saying it was aliens, possibly military or something, but 
I literally have no idea what this thing was. I visited Arizona in March of 2018 during my school's spring break. I'd already done the get drunk on the beach thing, so I figured I'd do something different. My uncle, aunt and first cousin lived in Flagstaff and they let me stay there for free so it was perfect. What happened isn't exactly terrifying but more unnerving. The first thing I noticed about Northern Arizona was that it had a very different vibe than my home state of Pennsylvania. I never fully felt at ease the whole time I was there. Right off the bat, my uncle told me a few stories about people dying in strange ways and going missing unexplainably. Now around two days into the trip, my uncle and I spent a long day exploring several interesting sites. We went to Walnut Canyon, <laughs> where there are some cliff dwellings, and then to an extinct volcano called Sunset Crater where NASA actually rehearsed the moon landings. When we're hiking up an escrimance of several hundreds of feet in lightly wooded terrain, the whole time I'm looking down at my boots because it's kind of steep and I don't want to make a wrong step. At one point, I looked up and directly in front of me is a girl in her mid-twenties and a man the same age ahead of her. It was strange because, even though there were trees, it was pretty wide open to the summit. And we should have seen them at some point, so this doesn't make sense. We made it to the top where there was a wide open vista and we stopped to take pictures. The couple did too. And we struck off a conversation. It turned out they're from France and were on a PAC marriage, a type of civil marriage that's their new thing there. I was kind of geeked because I'd been to France and loved the people so I tried some of my rusty French lingo. The girl giggled and answered back politely. I thought they seemed nice. My uncle started trash talking them to their face when he realises that they weren't married in a church, which appalled and embarrassed me. They kind of backed off and continued taking pictures. At one moment, I looked back at the couple, and when I did, it seemed as though they froze in time. I don't know for how long. The couple was standing side by side. Now, it looked as though they were barely making contact with each other. I snapped out of it and looked away, and my uncle started making his way back towards the trail, so we hiked down and left without seeing them again. Two days later, my uncle and I went and spent the day hiking along the rim of the Grand Canyon. At one point, a family came down the trail from ahead of us and stopped and talked to us for a minute or two. We parted ways. They went behind us. About two miles down the trail, the same exact couple came from just where they were before. The trail wasn't a loop. It was a straight shot along the rim one way up and down. My uncle this time was kind of confused and confrontational, like, how was a French couple in the exact same kind of area even further up? I said if he thought it was weird and he grunted and we continue in silence. Evening came and we retraced our steps and almost made it back to the truck. We made one last stop at an observation deck to take in the sunset. We spent about 15 minutes there, and it was packed with people, but there was sort of a revelant hush in the air because of the beauty of the moment. I got separated from my uncle and the crowd, but it was quiet enough that I could hear my uncle loudly exclaiming and sort of jeering at someone. I followed his voice. I found it was the same French couple we'd met a couple of days earlier. I already learned that 5 million people visit the Grand Canyon, so I'm shocked now and don't say anything at all. I remember my uncle going off about their marriage again and said something like, go ahead and seal the deal mate. He grabbed me and left. On the way back to the car he said, I have a feeling we're going to see them again. I was just like, this doesn't make any sense. We must have been about 90 miles ahead when we saw them again. Now my cousin worked in the EMS, so 
I didn't really get to see him for the first few days. He took me on a backcountry trip through the Navajo Reservation to obscure places that I'd never been before. He's pretty adventurous. It was myself, my cousin, and a friend he'd met when he was working as a guide on rafting trips through the Grand Canyon. She gave me a really bad vibe the moment I met her. She was 31, while both my cousin and I are only 22. I don't know, she was very mummy-like. We went to a bunch of different Navajo sites, and the last stop on the first day was Monument Valley. We drive up the road, and set up a camp there. My cousin mentioned skinwalkers, but didn't have any specific stories. He also said that he heard from a veteran emergency responder that they got a missing person report and followed footsteps into the desert with dogs on the scent trail, but the footsteps actually stopped in the middle of the desert without a trace or explanation, and the dogs went crazy when they reached a dead end. My cousin had the first two hand experiences when he first started EMS. He got called to a car accident in a valley leading to Sedona. The car was badly mangled. They couldn't even find a body. They end up searching the woods, and about 50 feet into the tree line, there's a man sitting against a tree, wide eyes, no visible injuries from the wreck. He said he never heard what the cause of death was. The last story was from a search for a missing person at the Grand Canyon. He was some sort of professor or geologist type researcher, and was midway down the canyon with another individual. They split up, and the professor guy said he'd meet his friend on the other side of a butte, which is a large rock overcut. The friend took a low path, and the professor cut right across. They should have met up a couple of minutes later, but the professor vanishes without a trace. My cousin said they searched for him for weeks with helicopters but never found him. If anyone's heard this story, let me know. We walked for a long while, and there were more stories that I can't fully remember. We were camped along the base of a small rock outcrop. I've been facing towards the rocks most of the night, but before we turned in, I looked out into the desert before any darkness fell. I saw that it was as flat and as far as the eye can see. You could see for miles without obstruction. I live near a city, and at home on overcast nights, the lights from the city bounced off the clouds, giving a soft white glow. That night in the desert, I saw the same glow as if from a city off towards the horizon, lighting up from one end to the other. I asked my cousin is there a city, and he said it's probably Vegas, but we're facing north in Utah, so it definitely isn't Vegas. I scan 360 degrees around and it's pitch black. I finally get into the tent to try and sleep. I've never been in the desert before, so I don't know the atmosphere and what it's supposed to be like. I've read a bunch of posts about an extreme hushed silence and stillness. But I've heard about rooms built in a vacuum, devoid of any sound, and apparently the silence is painful. That's the closest to that I've ever experienced at night. There was no wind or atmospheric pressure, and I could hear my own blood pulsating in my ears and my heartbeat. The silence was painful. When I finally managed to get some sleep, I have a nightmare about a corpse being buried next to me. The next day was fine for the most part, but as soon as the night fell, I developed an excruciating headache that radiated throughout my entire body and made me feel sick to the gut. I figure it's dehydration. Even though I'd been drinking water throughout the day, I gulped down two lots of water and took a handful of Tylenol, but to no effect. We dropped off my cousin's friend and stopped for some food. At the time I was still a member of the Catholic Church, and went to a Catholic university. My family I was staying with, and some of the others we met, they would tell me I'm very Catholic, and it's weird I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It seemed weird. Now, 
For some strange reason, my cousin took me to the empty parking lot of a Catholic church so we could order some food. It was here that he told me he felt like it was humanity's destiny to kill and make war in an endless cycle and that he wants to join the military for that purpose. On the other hand, I'm a humanity loving, peacenik sort of dude so this scares the life out of me. My headache got worse and I think I was picking up on some serious negative vibes. I couldn't eat any food and save it for the next day. Nothing else strange happened, but it was more the accumulation of things that really freaked me out on this trip. Now as some updates, it seemed like the two days we spent out on the Navajo reservation, my cousin and his best friend were trying to squeeze out every last piece of sightseeing they could on the trip not for my sake either, but their own curiosity. It was exhausting, and I wonder if they could tell how tired I was. I have no idea what the place is called, but it's near Tuba City, Arizona apparently. It's a pretty interesting place, and it's in the absolute godforsaken middle of nowhere. Growing up, I always went to my grandma's house. My childhood had a parent with substance issues, and going to my grandma's house was the best. I had friends there, and she lived in a really nice suburb with tons of other kids my age. I made really good friends with a neighbor who had woods in his backyard. Let's call him Mike for the sake of the story. We'd often take little lunches packed by my grandma and go out into the woods and eat them, admiring the creeks and birds, collect pebbles and stuff. You know, kid stuff. This was harmless and you could usually always see the backs of the houses when you went into the woods. I remembered one day, we made a pack. Mine was in a grocery bag and planned to venture out further than before, you know. You have limitless energy when you're young, and low pain hasn't set in yet from sitting at a desk for ages. I mean, you could literally walk for hours, and probably miles, and not even notice it. So we walk even further than ever. Now we slide down a hill. I remembered being really scared of this, and hilariously, I'm still majorly scared of falling when hiking. But anyway, I got a little scuffed up, but nothing major. Mike was slightly older than me, so I wanted to seem tough and just walk it off. We go deep into the woods, and I remembered being just slightly creeped out, but not enough to protest. I want to explore. Two, this hasn't changed. This is in Western PA, I should add. We weren't in the rural areas of my state, but some of the suburbs do intersect with trails and nature preserves which can go on for acres and acres. We came upon a tent in the middle of freaking nowhere and I remembered being terrified. My grandma gave me a lot of freedom because I was responsible. This was in the 90s, aside from needing to be home before the streetlights every night, stranger danger was something she drilled into my head. This set off the internal stranger danger alarm loudly but I was too afraid to leave Mike's side. So we approached the tent, even though everything inside of me is telling me to get out of there. Mike goes up to it, and tentatively I follow him. At first, I thought somebody was camping, but it still looks more permanent than that. Anyway, there's a fire outside and smoke burning, but it's been doused. There were bones everywhere, skulls mostly, tiny ones, which to my unattained eye looked like animal bones. There were also little pelts of animals covered everywhere in what appears to be paint and symbols. My adrenaline kicks in and I ran, Mike also. We ran so far and so fast that we fell down the side of the hill and ended up emerging from the woods on the other side of a shooting range. The men firings were screaming at us to leave. I was so scared of the tent that I didn't process the real danger which was at the shooting range. 
We definitely could have died very tragically because of that. So looking back on this memory, I was wondering, what the hell is this guy doing? There were literally bones everywhere and symbols. Now I dog sit for a family friend. They prefer to have somebody stay at the house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere and love the countryside. So for me, this is like a staycation because I live in the city now and never have time to myself. Anyway, the house is out in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I really mean literally it takes two hours to get from work to this place. There is one neighbour within five miles and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need but also help keep you safer knowing that you actually have somebody nearby. However, this guy has done nothing but make me feel unsafe as hell. So anyway, eventually I make it to Terry and Johnny's house and they're telling me the drill when to feed the dogs which are two super cute and spoiled Australian cattle dogs, watering the plants, etc. Then, as they're loading up their stuff to take it to the car, Terry says, Oh, don't forget to tell her about Steve. Johnny says, Oh, yeah, don't worry about the neighbour across the street. He's harmless. He drinks a lot, but he's harmless. Hell, the guy lost his licence so many times, all he can do is go up and down on a moped. However, just in case. This is where we keep the gun. Steve has three don't tread on me confederate flags, two plain confederate flags which are all hanging from his porch. Of course he's weird. He then takes me to his gun and explains that it's loaded if I want to use it so I don't even need to cock it, just pull the trigger extra hard. At this point I'm like, whatever. You keep a gun in your house when it takes at least 45 minutes for the police to show up, so I get it. Still, I've got no worries. I'm used to drunken weirdos. I know how to handle them. I love this life in the middle of nowhere, and I've got two protective dogs that will attack on command, so I feel pretty safe. Terry and Johnny leave around 3pm. I took the dogs for a walk and play some frisbee, and begin to unload my stuff while they're still worn out from running. As I come back out for my second load of stuff, I hear the neighbour, Steve, slam his door, seemingly having a phone conversation. I hear him go, where the hell did you go? The dogs are hearing him now and growling. I tell them to stay calm. I then hear him say, I don't care about my kids, screw you. And then, he throws something on the unpaved road behind me. Turns out it's his cell phone. As I'm grabbing my stuff, the dogs start going crazy and run a few feet behind me, barking viciously. I drop my stuff and turn around to see the neighbour at the end of the driveway, 75 or 50 feet away just staring at me. I tell the dogs to calm down and to get back on my side and they do. I then give Steve a friendly wave, thinking this is weird. He then takes a step forward and says, You are right, in a manipulative voice. Steve is wearing dirty jeans, work boots, dirty red hoodie, and a red hat with confederate flags on it. He also got brown dirty hair down to his shoulders, and a beard that's probably 5 inches long. Yeah, I'm okay, and I say my name. I'm just here sitting Johnny and Terry's dogs for the week. I look down at the dogs to see their reaction. They look as though they're about to attack him in a way I've never seen before. How are you? I ask him. I'm Steve. Thanks for being a good neighbour and checking me. I'm good. You okay? In silence again. Now this silence lasts for probably a whole minute and I figure, he's wasted. I need to get inside. So I turn around and finish grabbing my stuff. As I do so, I hear him take one more step on the gravel driveway and the dogs bark again. And Steve says, I know them, they're not gonna hurt me. 
They're good dogs for sure. They won't hurt me. I begin feeling very uneasy. So I close my trunk and turn around to see if he's going to say anything else. I was about to tell him that I was going inside and then, instead, awkwardly he says, Yeah, I am... Yeah, what? And yelled. I'm shocked and he says, Yeah. I'm going inside now. Have a good night. I turn around and the dogs follow me. Steve instead continues to stand where I left him for literally 15 minutes later. Now this house doesn't have a front door, there's a side door at the back. The back door is the main door because of the front of the house has these big green privacy trees. So I can't even see him through the front window. You can't see either doors from the street, you have to come onto the property to see them. It's about 6 o'clock and where I'm at, the sun starts going down around then, but doesn't usually get dark until 9.15 during the summer. Anyway, the dogs and I are on the couch and I have my headphones on and I'm playing Red Dead Redemption 2 online. All of a sudden, the dogs flip out, running towards the back door barking and growling. I'm like, what the hell? They don't usually do that unless somebody pulls in their car and they don't know who it is. I'm not having anyone over, so I grab my knife which is close by and start walking towards the back door. The dogs are still going crazy and I have no idea what they're looking at. I don't see anything, but then I look closer. I see mopped towel lights in the driveway seemingly hiding behind my car. I then try and focus in and see that Steve is turned around staring at the back of the house from his moped, ducking behind my car. I get the dogs and try and be quiet. I need to see what he's doing. The dogs are still growling but at least I've not given away my location right now. I watch him for 5 minutes. No movement, just a general creepy stare in my direction. I don't think he can see me, I'm not sure. He then shuts off his moped and proceeds to crouch next to my car. Where I can see him now peeking into my car windows. I don't see him, I'm trying to get in which is weird. He's not crouching now. Obviously he feels like nobody's watching, and doesn't care. He stops looking into my car and turns to the house. Creepy as hell. At this point I text Terry and tell her that Steve is doing some weird stuff and I'm getting worried. I get a text back saying call the cops if you feel unsafe. They know him. They can come talk to him reminding me to tell you about the time he was standing out by the tree at 6am when I was leaving for work and he was still there when we came back. We think he had a psychotic breakout. How comforting is that? So, I told myself down some, this guy is wasted, however, if he starts getting close to the door, I'm calling the cops. Dumb idea, looking back because the cops can take such a long time to get here. I'm watching him as he makes his second round looking at my car. He then gets on his moped and drives off. And he passes the window that faces the driveway. He's fed up, trying to make it so I wouldn't see him if I were watching TV. Now it's like 8pm, the dogs are going crazy again. I look out and now the moped is parked in plain view and he's standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house staring and talking to himself. I previously turned off all the lights so that he can't really see in. I see him take a single step towards the door, now 30 feet away. I grab the gun. I've calmed the dogs down and they're in full protective mode. One dog to my left and one to the right. It's around 8.15pm now and I call the cops. I explain my situation and the owners think that he had a psychotic breakdown. As I'm halfway through explaining this, I'm really scared for my safety and the operator says ma'am. She then says, I'm sorry but you're not located in our county, I have to transfer you to this one. Are you serious? The owner said that the cops in South know him very well and how to handle him. Isn't that the guy? Yes ma'am, that is us but you are located in a different county, this is not our jurisdiction. 
The guy who's bothering me lives in your county, that's why I'm calling you. And the operator transfers me to another one. When she answers the phone with the average 911, what's your emergency? I'm silent. I'm looking out the kitchen window. Steve's about four or five feet closer from before. I explain what's happening and that I was transferred because apparently I'm not in their jurisdiction. She tells me to remain calm and turn on all the lights. I said no, the guy's waiting for me to do something like that. The doors are locked. I do have a firearm. If he enters, I will shoot. She then tells me that it's safest with the lights on. I turn on the lights. He notices. He then turns around to get on his moped and goes back home. I tell her what's happened. She said do I want an officer, I say hell yeah. Apparently the cops in South and this state know him, but she transferred me to you. This is the third time he's come onto this property and he's getting closer to the door and I'm not safe. Calm down ma'am. We will still send somebody, however, based on where you're located it's gonna take a while. I say that's fine. I say if she will stay on the line. She says that it's not really possible because she has to take other calls but to call back if anything else happens without hesitation. Now it's about 9pm and the sun is getting ready to set completely. Again, the dogs are going crazy. Now I'm getting real annoyed and walking around the house with a loaded gun so if Steve sees me, he knows I have a gun. I look out the window and see his moped but I don't see him. Where the hell is he? From the window in the kitchen, I can't see the back door. I go upstairs. One of the dogs follows and peek through the window in the bathroom. Steve is on the back porch, lighting matches, frying them down onto the wooden porch. He doesn't seem harmless anymore. He's talking to himself and twisting his head back and forth like he's getting warmed up for a fight or having a conversation with multiple people. I start filming from upstairs. So now, I try and hide my phone, just in case he goes up for it. The sun is down and it's getting dark. He steps onto the door and starts knocking. He starts pounding on the door. I'm pretty good at staying calm in any situation but my heart's beating. He then stops pounding the door, quickly turns away and runs to his moped and takes off even faster than I thought he could go. Not even a minute later. I see a cop pulling into the driveway. I mention to the dispatcher operator that I have two dogs that will bark at the officer but will not attack. They are trained to be like this. I say I'm going to leave the firearm inside when I go to meet the officer. I meet the officer and the dogs don't growl, simply gave a bark, letting me know that someone's there. I went outside to meet him and told him that the guy just took off on a moped and he says, oh yeah, I think I passed him. I explain that he is absolutely drunk or crazy and in his own world and that normal people don't act this way. The cop basically shrugs off everything and says, well, are you going to stay there the night? I said no, I will leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I ask him to stay while I pack up everything. I go inside give the dogs lots of love and treats and create what they need for the night. I take off and return the next day with my dad. My dad begins walking the perimeter to try and show him that the man is also staying here. Now I'm a 24 year old female, if you're wondering, then Steve wearing the same dirty hat and outfit while holding a 24 case of Budweiser's is standing at the end of the driveway again. I'm watching him from the front window. I see my dad at the other end, and he sees him. Steve immediately turns around and goes back into the house. Now I later learned that Steve has been to jail multiple times due to domestic abuse and his kids can't even see him. He's very violent. No one knows how he gets money to get things. Terry and Johnny have never seen him leave for work. They've only seen him on his moped or four-wheeler that he recently bought. I don't know who he thought I was, but every time he looked in my direction, I saw pure hatred in my eyes 
an evil intent. I'm really glad my dad come to stay with me because God knows what would have happened if he didn't. I've been staffed at a summer camp for five years now. A long-standing tradition is that some of the senior staffers will regularly sneak out during night to drive into town to hang out and generally be hooligans. Me and four other guys pushed a car around the bend from the parking lot to avoid waking up the adults, then hopped inside and headed towards the town. After a couple of hours of jokes, by job blast from Taco Bell and teaching one of our goons how to drive in an empty parking lot. We're driving down country roads, joking around listening to music. That is, until we turn down a random road and something immediately fills off. It's about 3.30am and we start down a hill and suddenly, the road goes from asphalt to gravel to dirt. We noticed an old rusted out boat trailer on its side a bunch of old tools, rotting piles of wood, and a general mess. When we reach the bottom of the hill, there's a big shed with a garage door that's wide open, and another shed seemingly made out of plywood with a door creaked open. There's a light, just shining through, flickering from a fuse box right outside. The mood in the car changed in an instant. For a moment, we're all sat in silence watching the flicker and light. No one said anything, but we could all tell that something doesn't feel right. Eventually, to ease the tension that we're all feeling, we start to make a joke, jeering at one of our friends to go and turn the light off or open the door. However, suddenly, the door opens. The mood immediately changes. Nobody said anything. For the next few moments, they're a blur, but I can assure you that it was the fastest and early 2000s Toyota Camry has ever went off the road. All five of us are completely silent for the drive back. Something about the aura of that place felt off. To this day, I imagine sitting in the front seat of the car, and I start getting an uneasy feeling in my stomach. Who is behind that door? Why were they there at almost four in the morning? Why couldn't I see anybody else around and why did it feel so off? Okay, so let me start by saying I'm a 23 year old. At the time of this story, I was 19, five foot five, fat girl from England. My weight and country come into play later. So I would take my dog for walks at night, that was until this experience. Now it's not the kind of dark where you can't see anything, but the kind where you can't make out much further in front of you. As a disclaimer, this is the middle of nowhere. We're in a village where everyone knows each other and strangers are rarely spotted. Now a fair few of my neighbours walk late at night, and I meet most of them and there's usually the 6 foot 3, heavily tattooed 46 year old man with two friendly big dogs, one Mastiff and another German Shepherd. We were great friends and still are. Now on this particular night, I bumped into him, just ending his walk which happened to be a couple of times, and it's no big worry. I'm around half an hour into my 45 minute walk in the woods, earphones in with music playing and just checking my phone to see what song's on next. I notice my dog is looking up as if he can see something. I assume it's another neighbour, fox or deer. I looked up calmly and I see a strange man standing about 20 foot away from me, holding a rifle. Not a dog. It wasn't hunting season and this is England so you can't really get guns unless you're a farmer, let alone a rifle. He looks angry and stares at me. At this point, I remembered my head torch and he turns to look at me. He angles himself to my face. And at this point, I know I couldn't turn around or run since I'm out of shape. I carry on walking. As we go past, my dog gives him a wide berth, which 
is very unusual because he's normally friendly and loves everyone. I'm very confused by this. Now, I shuffle past him and say even in. I try and speed walk out of there. I look over my shoulder as I'm about to leave the woods. I saw he hasn't moved an inch and he's still staring at me. I never walked alone at night again. This freaked me out so much because it never happened since and there's no hunters near me. I'm certain he was not meant to have that gun. And I'm sure I've heard a gun go off at some point around the time of my travels near then. Back in the early 90s, I was a kid, around 13 at the time of the incident. I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in SE, Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked, dirt roads to get to their house. The closest neighbours besides my aunt and uncle, who lived about a quarter of a mile off a dirt road, was a mile away. This was very backwards and isolated from the rest of civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip away. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived up in this house since my mum was a child and had both grown up a ways down the dirt road. Anyway, there was a general store roughly three or four miles down the network of dirt roads. Now this is your typical country dirt road shop. It's run by an old lady and her husband, and its customers only consisted of people who lived out there. Now one day, my grandmother said to me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get some milk, eggs and a few other miscellaneous items. I said sure. She gave me some money and I headed on my way. Now it was fairly early in the day and I had plenty of time to get back before dark which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming. Things can get pretty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall. It's a darkness unlike most people have actually experienced before, due to no light pollution and not really many street lamps. Now me being a 13 year old, had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek creating crawdads and such. By the time I left the store, I realised it was quickly approaching night. This was full, and darkness set upon the land very early. I didn't want to be walking these lonely roads, especially not through the woods, so I got as quick as I can. I'm running and sprinting as much as possible, but it's not enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the ridge, it's almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a very bright nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill was a road that's perfectly straight and flat, with the woods on the left side and a large hill on the right. About half a mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of lights at their house. I'm starting to feel a little bit better now, but I'm still not feeling very good. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes have only just adjusted to the darkness. As I walk up the road, I hear something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rustled. I turned around and see nothing at first, but then, as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch, a black shadowy shape slowly moving towards me. At first I think it's a dog, but then I realise it's way too large to be one. And then I realise it wasn't actually walking on four legs, it was kind of crawling, like a person. I stare for a moment, out of sheer confusement, trying to figure out what I was seeing, and then, a jolt of fear shudders me as it dawns on me. Whatever this thing was, had been trying to sneak up on me for a while. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on its two feet like a normal person. It had the shape of a human but long arms, legs and such, 
It stood roughly 7 to 8 feet in height and was completely covered in black or maybe dark brown hair. His face is dark in colour, and I can't really recall seeing much in the way of features. It was no bear, that's for certain, or any other kind of animal that I know for that matter. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I'd been carrying and bolted as fast as I could, trying to get towards my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing and weird sound behind me, hearing footsteps on the gravel as whatever this thing is starts to chase me. Now I didn't turn around to look because I didn't need to. I can hear it crashing into the woods, earth shattering, and some ungodly scream coming out of that thing, a sound I've never heard before. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as though it was about to explode from my chest. It's a type of adrenaline that I've never had before. I must have been sprinting as fast as possible for half a mile. I flew into the house and, in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, tried to explain to my grandparents what happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe something scared me, which annoyed me, thinking it was some kind of dog. The next morning I woke up, and I can see my grandpa sitting outside on the porch, whittling wood underneath the shaded tree in front of the yard, as he often does. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He's a very rational man, down to earth, grown up and hunted in that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped out into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in the woods what noises they made, where to find them, and how to catch them, etc. I'd only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but had been going out into these woods with him since I was pretty young, going on walks and such. He had passed a lot of knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what happened, and told him I knew what I saw. I wasn't being over exaggerative, and it wasn't due to my imagination. I wasn't making it up, and it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't some dumb 13 year old kid. He knew what I saw was real. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes and said, I know what you saw. I've seen it there before too. There's something out in them woods that people don't understand, and that's someone that you don't want to mess with. I remember those words very clearly to those days because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realise that whatever I'd seen was very real in existence and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods, there are some cliffs at the bottom of these cliffs in a cave. He told me that that cave is where the creature lived. He once stumbled upon it a long time ago while hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at the creature fitting the same description, and it emerged and began to scream throwing rocks at him. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing chased him. My grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get back, he had to run a distance, but luckily he managed to put some good space between them. He said the whole way back home, he felt as though he was being watched, and kept hearing twigs snap behind him. He was certain that it was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turns to look towards the trees, and he can see this thing peeking out behind a tree staring at him. Later that night, he said that my grandmother awoke in the early hours of morning to find large rocks being thrown at the house in, as well as hearing an unholy sound screeching out of the creature. He said he could hear it walking around on the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on the windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low deep voice. But it didn't sound like a normal language, just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, that thing went back to frying some more rocks and howling. So my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it off, and into the darkness where this thing's running into the woods. Now, he didn't know if he'd hit it or not, 
He said that that was the last time he ever saw or heard from it. However, over the years, farmers would report cows being mutilated, or someone's hunting dog would go unexplainably missing, or somebody would have a story about some strange creature they'd seen. He said it only scared my grandmother beyond words, and she absolutely refused to talk about it ever or even acknowledge that it happened which explains her acting weird about it when I told her. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, but please believe me, this is true. And till this day, I've never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa. This happened to me over a decade ago, but I'll never forget the feeling deep in my chest. Both that night and the following morning when the true nature of the situation become apparent to me. It was late December in a small Texan town. We just received five inches of snow in the day. I can't remember what time it was. It's dark out and I'm playing in my room. It's important to note that my room was made up of two rooms. A mudroom with a door leading to our front and my actual bedroom. The door was an older style wooden door with an all old wood hardware and a window on the top half. It had a window shade but that wouldn't stop anyone from looking in if they wanted. My room was the most front faced with my parents being to the back of the house. I was in my mud room playing with my hot wheels when I felt weird. It felt like somebody's watching me. I was facing the door at this point and look up at the window. I was trying to focus on the little openings left by the window shade. I started looking for some reason and start running. After a while, I'm sure nobody's there, so I went back to playing. A few minutes later, I get the feeling again. This time, I didn't look up at the door, but instead, I looked towards the window. I was just hoping that it's all in my head. Just then, the most terrifying thing happened. There was a noise at the door, the doorknobs being touched. I was still facing the door, completely frozen at the sound of the metallic doorknob. I don't know why or how, but it was moving, slowly turning, testing the lock. I want to move, but I'm frozen. It was like somebody glued over every joint in my body. My chest felt like a car was parked on it. My parents weren't immediately there, so I'm all on my own now. And suddenly, the door lob is being yanked with force. The door was one that had been locked with a skeleton key, so the doorknob could move freely. There's two deadbolts. Whoever was on the other side just figured out the doorknob was free to open. As soon as I heard the doorknob turn all the way, I sprang up the wall about five feet. The door fell silent. I'm glued to the wall unable to move. The doorknob continues to slowly move. Whoever did so started trying to budge on the door trying to pry it open, pounding on the door with their foot, kicking it. I froze until I started screaming for my life. I sprinted to the back of the house to get my parents. They asked me what's wrong, and I said somebody's tried to break in. They ran inside and checked, not bothering to check outside, which I pleaded with them to do. They said it's my imagination running wild or an animal. They took one final look and said go to bed. It took me hours. I mean, I don't even remember going to sleep. All I remember is staring at the doorknob from my bed, never taking my eyes off of it. Suddenly... I woke up to my parents who were obviously distressed and scared. My mum grabbed me by the shoulders, getting in front of me. She asked very sternly why I thought somebody tried to break in. When I say they listen, I was worried about how serious they were suddenly. When I thought they said it was my imagination, they took me to the front door, then to the backyard door and pointed to the door near the driveway. You can clearly see boot prints in the snow walking along the street, through our yard and straight to the window, then my mudroom door. 
This is where I'd been playing the night prior. The police showed up and took a report, but nothing ever come of it. I was never able to sleep while in that house again. I can never forget what it felt like as a child going through this and to have my parents not believe me. I'm just glad I wasn't home alone and thank God for the deadbolts.